Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Let me begin by showing you a quick demo of uh, neural networks in action. Okay. Uh, so here we have uh, this demo done in TensorFlow, um, which is one of the libraries where you can set up um, uh, many different types of deep learning problems okay uh, so let me just show you I can set up uh, I can select my data from here so I selected this data set which is actually a linearly separable data set this should be very easy for the network to learn uh, and I have two features x1 and x2 as input which is the x1 value and the x2 value of the data all right uh, and then I have a hidden layer with let's say um, uh, two neurons okay and then I have an output layer with two neurons. Each one of them is like a classification probability of, of each of the classes, okay? Um, so I have some parameters here, learning rate, activation function, regularization. I haven't talked about regularization, but inshallah we'll do that quickly uh, tomorrow. Uh, and the problem type is classification type. Um, so uh, here I can add some noise in data. I'm not doing that. Uh, this is very important parameter, the ratio of training to test data. Uh, so we always need to keep test data separate. So that's set at 50% right now. And uh, so 50% of the points will be randomly picked and they will be used for training and then the test error. Okay. And this is a very important parameter, batch size. Uh, you know that in uh, gradient descent, I need to look at all the points to make one update to the weights. Uh, in uh, Stochastic gradient descent, I look at only one point and make an update. Uh, what you can do is, uh, which is a recommended strategy, is not look at one point, but also not look at all the data, but look at a few points. So your statistical estimate of which direction to move in becomes a little bit more accurate because you are looking at a few points and not just a single point. Okay, so that's called the batch size. So the batch size is set to 10, which means I will pick 10 data points and compute the gradient, compute the back propagation based on those 10, uh, based on the input coming from those 10 data points. Okay. And then do one weight update, one back propagation pass after getting information from 10 data points. Okay. So that's the kind of strategy. Yes. If you do, if you do with just one and then do an update, then that's stochastic gradient descent. And there, the variance of the grade, of the directions that you will get around the gradient direction will actually be more. Because any data point, it's only one point it can put you. Now, it, it's just like, it's a statistical estimate, right? Where do you want to go? Uh, which direction do you want to take a step in? So if you, if you sample 10 points and randomly sample 10 points and then pick a direction to go, that's likely to be better than that it's likely to be more closer to the actual gradient direction, right? The variance of the error will come down because the sample size is high. That's the basic principle in statistics. Of course, uh, I mean, of course, but you're choosing 10 points is better than choosing one point randomly, right? That's, that's the idea. I ask you, any statistical problem, go estimate the average height of people at Lums. You, you measure the height of just one person and say that's the average height. So that would be off, likely. Then you, then you do that again, then you do that again, then you do that again, right? So you do that like 200 times every time you report the average uh, height, but you are only taking one sample. So what I can do is I can take the average of your average because that will be a better estimate. Right, that's the stochastic gradient descent strategy. Now, if you if you have a little bit more time, what you can do is okay, let me go and find the average height of uh, uh, of uh, people in. Uh, uh, I, I mean, let me let me take ten people and find the average height. Now, the variance of your error, the variance of your estimate will be less. Right, that's the basic principle in uh, estimation theory or statistics. Okay. So here they say, okay, maybe we'll converge faster. Uh, I can't look at all the points because there are millions of them, but let me, let me converge, let me take a little bit more intelligent decision than what I can take with stochastic gradient descent by two, doing this batch size of 10 strategy. So I can have 10 or 15 or 20 or five, I can have some sort of batch size, yes. Uh, 
Yes. Exactly like if if the entire so if the batch size becomes n, then this is gradient descent. If the batch size becomes one, it is stochastic gradient descent. Now you are somewhere in the middle of it. We have discussed that before, right? I showed you a graph, remember? Where you, I mean, if you have too high a learning rate, you might not converge at all. Let's see. Let me run this, okay? So now learning is happening. Notice that because this was an easy data set, my training loss and my uh, test loss came down very quickly, okay? What, what do I have here? Epochs. Epochs is one full pass through your data. So if data had, let's say, a thousand points and your batch size was 10, then and you were go sequentially going through data then in a hundred iterations you will complete one epoch an epoch is one complete pass through data okay so we did just did 526 epochs and we actually didn't need to do that because it converts very very quickly all right because this was an easy data set even with a very small network i was able to do that Okay, uh, they have lot. Uh, they have lots of like tool tips here telling you what is the weight on each link. Uh, the width of a link is proportional to its weight, and what's the local decision that each link is taking, and so on. So it's actually a very interesting uh, demo that's happening here. Here I have a choice a choice of activation functions. We use an activation function of tan hyperbolic. I could use sigmoid. If I use linear, then that means this neural network is not going to learn nonlinear boundaries at all, because the linear function is is not is not going to allow you to learn nonlinear boundaries or i could use a relu and still i converge pretty fast to a test or training loss of zero okay all right yes question yes no that doesn't that doesn't really mean anything because because there are two classes, so you need two outputs to classify. So then you have three outputs. That would be for three classes. It will learn a third class, which is not really there. <laughs> right? Okay, so let me choose a more difficult data set. Let's pick this one. Now, this data set is not linearly separable. Okay, let me run this. It's trying to find something okay but notice that my capacity is quite limited my capacity is only two neurons here okay so essentially it's like two perceptrons okay so essentially i can learn a piecewise linear boundary that has only two linear units okay so 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 therefore my training loss and my test loss they do not come down quite much more than this okay so what I can do now is I realize that this is too small a network to learn this complicated data. Let me, oops, let me add some layers here. Okay, so I, I learned like four. Now this is like four perceptrons, but with of course a nonlinear function, but this, is, this should be able to learn four boundaries. So it's learning, learning, and yes, it came down to a pretty good error rate now. Okay. Yes. Would it have learned the boundaries with two neurons but at a longer time? No, because the capacity is not there. Let's let's try that. Each each of them can make a linear boundary. So two can make this sort of boundary. So that's about it. I mean it can't get any better two boundaries than these. Yes? okay so that's a good question actually one can show one can prove that whatever I can do with multiple layers I can always do that with one layer also uh, but that one layer will become very very large it it will actually become exponentially large okay so multiple layers multiple la multiple layers are a way to make more and more complicated nonlinear functions and you can if you have a nonlinearity inside you can make any nonlinear function by piecewise linear functions okay so you can actually always do whatever you can do with multiple layers you can always do with one really big layer that's that's actually theoretically provable okay 
but we don't do that because the actual number of neurons in that layer becomes very very large because i have to actually now make a polynomial approximation of that order and that might be a, actually a very large order so what i can do i can do that with a bit lesser number of neurons uh, when they are staggered in multiple layers because i can generate more complicated functions if i have one layer and i put an x layer then i can get x square type of terms in that and and I'll, uh, there are a lot of those because there are lots of neurons okay so i can make lots of x square curves a piecewise combination of quadratic curves and so on okay so you you can get a, actually a pretty good picture of at least in your mind of what the network can do depending on the size of the network okay all right so so let's say let's say i tried three here well that's going to be a bit better okay i can try four it has now more, let, let me try six now it has a lot of capacity actually maybe a bit more than the what the problem required because the problem was directly divided by three or four okay but yeah you see that my training loss there's no gap between my training loss and test loss uh, uh that means that my network has converged well uh if if there is no gap between training loss and test loss and the overall loss is low then that's a good situation if there is no gap between training loss and test loss but the overall error is high like in this case okay the error is not coming down even though the training loss and test loss are close to each other then so so that means you have an issue of capacity okay all right so let's try an even harder data set like this one okay and uh, let me choose well what four four here and let's see that's not bad at all okay let me choose less three So I got like three cuts to this, which is approximating the circular distribution in the middle. Okay. Um, let me try an even harder data set, a really crazy data set actually. <laughs> this is in two dimensions about, for two dimensions, two category problem. This is about ha as hard as I can make it. <laughs> yes. That, uh, well, it wasn't, but it can actually happen that way. If you have an overcapacity, you might have a tendency to overfit also. Uh, that's why you have to keep the training set separate, right? Uh, remember that capacity can allow you more wiggles in your Bayesian surface. Okay, so now let's try this problem. And now here, look at the gap between the training loss and the test loss. and they seem to be playing hard <laughs> trying to do something okay but it's not working out so let me let me make like a larger network maybe with a significantly more capacity okay um this kind of a network Let's say five, four, three, and then two neurons. I made this network. Let me try this. So, it's still having a lot of difficulty, even though, there we go. There's a bit of improvement in training loss. We found a more, remember these are highly nonlinear surface and you're searching on that surface. Uh, and this surface is now much higher dimensional because I have a lot of weights now compared to the previous one. Okay. Uh, so we say 10 weight and see, and people get really expert in trying to interpret the uh, loss curves and try to guess from that what's going on. Okay.
One of the things that um, adds a lot of value is uh, regularization. And uh, I haven't really talked about that. Uh, we will we will do that inshallah in tomorrow's lecture if we get time. But uh, that kind of improves uh, improves your capacity. Okay, so the, there's a demo you can you can play around with these parameters. And yes, it's possible to learn this problem and in fact get very low error rates. But you have to play around with parameters to try to do that. Uh, one of the things that people can do also which we normally don't do in deep networks but you can actually add more features okay so maybe i add uh, that's like that's like pushing the data into a higher dimensional space uh, by adding more features so let me add for example sine x and uh, sine of x on and sine of x2 as features of x so so my data was two dimensional i made it just four dimensional and then i start uh, learning um, so you can you can play around with these parameters and try to see which ones you uh, which ones kind of work well for you okay all right i will um, i will um, stop here oh there we go we just found like ooh, like a much better mode than where we were stuck for a long time and then you continue and maybe it will kind of find something better but actually actually now look at the orange points a lot of them are in collect correct classification and look at the blue points a lot of them are in collect classification there's a bit of error rate here for blue and a bit of error rate here for orange but other than that it has kind of learned something but it seems to have gone flat now it, it can't it's trying to explore and it can't find any any better solution okay all right And then you can play around with learning rate and what 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 tip what typically people do is once you once you become flat and you are not improving anything they they go and reduce the learning rate let's say by a factor of ten and then see if those smaller steps are going to help me or not uh, so that's there are lots of tricks of how to uh, how to make them converge better all right. So uh, I just wanted to uh, for you to see this. Uh, let me let me go back to my slides and start about the very in interesting architecture, uh, which has really made uh, the image processing stuff uh, possible, uh, which is the convolutional neural network. Okay, uh, so it's a it's a slight change in the structure of the neural network that we discussed so far, uh, but it's a very important change and it makes the problem tractable compared to compared to the standard vanilla neural network which which wasn't tractable for images okay uh, and let me explain why uh, that's the case okay so this is a standard neural network what i have is uh, two inputs here and then i have a hidden layer of five neurons and a hidden layer of four neurons and then i have one output or maybe i have two outputs or however many outputs i have okay uh, and what i've really done here is connected everything to everything okay uh, so so they're going to be these weights are going to be a three by five matrix and these weights are going to be a five by four matrix okay so i've uh, so so between these two layers i have uh, 15 and 20 so 35 weights uh, and then four more here so i have 39 weights in this really small network okay now this strategy doesn't really scale up because if I'm talking about a two by two image, connecting that to one neuron will be these four links. So there will be four weights. Uh, but if I'm talking about a, a four by four 16 image, then I have 16 weights that are linking just to a single neuron. Now if in that layer I have a lot of neurons, then every one of them is getting linked to 16 neurons. Okay, so so think about, think about like a typical image size, let's say going into, oops, sorry. Think about the typical image size going into uh, a neural network okay so you have uh, let's say 200 by 200 uh, which is not a pretty large image it's like a small sized image okay uh, times uh, 3 because it's a color image so that's like 2 to the 4 so that's 40,000 right here right times 3 so that's like 120,000 weights 
just to connect to one neuron in the next layer. Okay. Now the next layer might also be, let's say 200 by 200 by three. Let's say I have the same size next layer as I have the image, suppose. So then that really means that in just the first layer, I'll have 120,000 square weights, right? Now that's a really crazy number. That's like one, two, three, four, five. So that's like something to the order of 10, uh, one into 10 to the power 10, right? It's that kind of order just to make like one layer, okay? Which is like 10 billion, okay? So you got 10 billion weights in one layer and then you were after making deep networks. <laughs> so you want to make a lot of layers, okay? So, so that's the real reason that you can't, you can't throw images directly into a deep neural network unless that neural network was actually very small or the images themselves were like really tiny, okay? Uh, otherwise, it's just too crazy a learning problem to uh, to tackle. Yes. Can we explain that why is square? I said, well, I haven't given you the size of the next layer, the neurons. But let's say I said, suppose that's like the same, the same size as the input layer. If that is, then for one neuron, I need like 120,000. So they're going to be... 120,000 by 120,000 matrix. Even if that layer is half the size, the order of magnitude is kind of of this order, right? So I'm just saying, in a in a large neural network where where you want to pass in an image directly, uh, the image has a crazy number of uh, parameters in it. Okay, so uh, I, I I mean the image is large size. So the neural network gets a crazy number of weights in it, a really high order of weights, because they keep getting multiplied with the layer size. So you get a really high number of weights. And then learning a gradient descent in that high dimensional space is uh, just not tractable. Therefore, what did people do? They either used really small images uh, or they used some image features. They didn't use the image directly. They said, why, why should I throw in all the pixels of the image inside the neural network? Let me pick some few features of the neural network and that is what I will use. Okay, a uh, few features of the image. So they came up with shift features or hog features and then you can train maybe a classifier on them because that vector is much lower dimensional. Okay, so, so that's really the problem that we have with neural networks. Okay, all right. So... So things changed in the computer. So, so the dominant paradigm in the computer vision community was, okay, the classifier really doesn't matter. The classifier is really standard. The classifier is SVM. It's a standard classifier. All SVMs are similar. There is really nothing new that I can do about those. Yeah, you have a question? Oh, okay, so the classifier really I'll keep standard and I will try to hunt for better and better features. And that's the kind of um, mindset through which the hog work came about. If you look at the hog paper, all the paper is not discussing the classifier. The classifier is SVM. Every know, everyone knows about SVM for the last 10 years. Okay, so, so they don't even discuss any peculiarities of the SVM itself. It, there's no new, new innovation in the classifier in that paper. All the innovation is that these are good features. If you, if you engineer these features and you give them to the classifier, the classifier would work well. Okay, so that was the dominant paradigm for at least like 15 years in the computer vision community till really 2012 when, 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 when the uh, LXNet paper came out by Jeffrey Hinton's group. And that paper is actually embedded in this data set which was created in 2008 and 9 by Fifi Lee and others. Uh, what they said was... Uh, uh, they were working on the image categorization problem. You have to tell, is this image of what category, okay? And they said, uh, so there's a history of data sets in computer vision also. Um, somebody came up with a Caltech 101 database where 
there were 101 categories of uh, of images that you had to classify and then somebody came up with a pascal walk data set where i don't know i don't know how many but maybe 300 or 400 categories were there okay and it's it's interesting to note from research point of view that when they came up with this caltech data set people could hardly classify like 10 categories well in 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 various uh, i mean if you have general images of high diversity and they came up with a data set of 100 categories and at that time i was thinking well i mean that's like a crazy data set there is no research that would reach that level but once you publish a good data set it becomes like a benchmark in research and people start to compete to uh, to uh, to try to reach that level of performance okay and these are annotated data sets so we are talking about supervised learning uh, so uh, so when these guys in 2007 8 9 framework they started making image net they said we are going to create a data set of 1000 categories and they're going to be like our target is like a thousand images per category so we are talking about a data annotated data set of a million images okay and now I think ImageNet has at least 14, 15 million images in it. Uh, at that time, this was like a crazy endeavor. It was, in fact, for a researcher, too risky to invest time into this because what, a, what is your contribution? You are just making a data set, right? Uh, uh, but, uh, but this group uh, did that. And that really spurred research in, in computer vision. So what started to happen was that uh, people started to compete and there was a challenge this uh, large scale image uh, uh, large scale uh, image recognition challenge and uh, and every year the performance started to go up in in that challenge in trying to classify these images into a thousand categories so you have a you have kind of a classifier where you will have thousand outputs for thousand categories okay and the input is some image features that people are doing in 2012 these guys wrote a paper uh, the Hinton group where they use deep learning for the first time and they beat the performance by I mean they increased the they they almost doubled the performance uh, on error rate they almost doubled the performance of what the other algorithms were doing okay and so that's where this deep learning buzz started so we'll we'll look at what architecture they used okay uh, because we understand that just taking the big image as input and uh, putting it, uh, putting these thousand categories at output and just having a fully connected type of deep network, that doesn't work. Uh, it just doesn't converge because there are just way too many ways to converge, okay? Uh, in this data set, by the way, they had a hierarchy of uh, categories, okay? So there's a mammal category and then in mammal category, those mammals that have placenta, that category, and then within that they have a carnivore category and carnivore they have canine category and then in canine they have a dog category. And in dog they have a working dog category and in working dog they have lots of types of working dogs, one of them is husky, okay? In fact, they have like, I think, 120 dog types there because uh, it's a cultural bias. The data set was done in West and people like have a different relationship with dogs in West than, than in our culture. Uh, if the data set was made here, we would have maybe maybe more cat categories than dog categories. I don't know. <laughs> okay, uh, or maybe maybe uh, maybe we uh, uh, we have a pet parrot at home. So maybe I, if I was making it, I'll put a lot of parrot categories there. <laughs> okay. Yes. Question. No, they uh, yeah they they did some standardization. So so the data set is constructed for computer vision problems, and I think they did standardization of uh, sizes and standardization of labels and so on. Okay, all right. So here's an example of uh, Hammer images in ImageNet data set. Uh, it's important to understand how the data set was created. Oh, just uh, I have to get rid of this guy. Okay, so it's important to understand how the data set was created of such a large size. Uh, so they had human annotators, uh, but they give them a word, a noun to collect images of. Okay, so, so they, gave, they gave them a word, okay, hammer. So the guy goes on Google and searches for hammer. Okay, and so he gets a lot of images from Google search about hammer. And then he manually filters them. Well, these ones are actually hammer and these ones are not. Okay, because you might get, let's say, hammerhead whale in uh, in in hammer data set uh, for Google. So so they will be manually filtered out. So the guy is asking binary questions: Is this hammer or not? Is this hammer or not? To actually 
to actually collect the data set. Okay. Now, notice that this, as a learning problem, this is extremely challenging to learn what is a hammer from these types of images. Uh, what is wrong with this? Okay. Uh, it's an extremely challenging problem to learn what is a hammer uh, from this. Uh, why is that a challenging? Because uh, uh, look at the diversity of viewpoints. Look at the diversity of the types of hammers. Uh, look at the diversity of lighting, background, angle. Uh, I mean, it's like it's like a really crazy learning problem. Can you learn from this what a hammer is? Okay. Uh, so I'm just giving you as one category as an example. Okay. Uh, in 2012. Uh, this uh, ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge. That's the. Uh, this was the paper by uh, by the last author is Hinton, uh, where uh, the different <coughs> techniques that people were proposing in that challenge. This is their classification error rate. Okay, and this deep learning paper has like this error rate. Uh, this is a huge jump over state of art. So next year, so there was only one paper using deep learning. In 2012, in 2013 cha uh, challenge, all the papers was using deep learning. <laughs> Nobody was using any other technique. Okay, that's how how large an impact uh, this took, uh, and that's why we are discussing it today here. Otherwise, we would we would not have. Okay. All right. So let me first start with a toy CNN, uh, just to give you a con conceptual understanding, and then I'll talk about it in more detail. And I'm going to go fast through this example because it's actually really a very trivial example. So what you have is, as input, you put an array of pixels. You are not, uh, this is one of the hallmarks of deep learning that you are actually not doing any feature engineering. Uh, uh, this, this, uh, the conventional wisdom before this that, okay, I need to search for better and better features. Uh, they said, well, why don't we just work with raw pixels? If you have raw pixels, we can just uh, kind of uh, learn from them. We don't have to do uh, anything else. Okay, those raw pixels are themselves features. Okay, and then there is a CNN, and that says that outputs a decision whether the picture was. Let's say I have a picture that can only be an X on a no, so that will say whether this is an X on a row. Okay, I'm I'm trying to learn that. Okay, so if I input an X, the output should be that the value of the X output should be high, and if I put input an O, then the value of O output should be high. So I want to learn this network uh, to be able to do that. Okay, but of course there are trickier cases, you need to be able to, there could be translation, scaling, rotation, weighing, uh, there could be noise. So so that's what the network has to learn, that for all of these it should say X and for all of these it should say O, even though they are not exactly similar. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise it would have been a trivial problem, I could just do template matching and, and, and see that. Okay. So, 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 so this might be actually a hard problem to say this is also an X and this is also an X. Okay. So, in a, in a computer you have numbers, so I've donated all the white, all, all the white pixels by one and all the, uh, all the uh, black pixels by minus one. Okay, let's say we take that representation. Okay, so how do we, do we tell that they are, uh, they are similar? Okay, now if I, if I have that, uh, uh, if I compare those two X's that I showed you on the previous slide, only like these five pixels are matching for them in white. All the others were actually not matching because one of them was a distorted X. Okay. So, what the what the convolution neural network approach is actually very similar to convolution that we have been talking about before uh, in edge detection. We we take a convolutional approach to learning patterns. Okay. And, and so how do we do that? We, we say that this X is really composed of some patterns, okay? If I break up the patterns, because remember there is some distortion in the image, right? But if I break up the patterns, I see that this green pattern and this green pattern are the same actually, and I can maybe tell that they are, they are similar. And even this blue pattern, which wasn't exactly at the same place, but even this blue pattern here and this blue pattern are the same and so on, this blue and this, this one and this one are the same. So, so I can say that there is some similarity between them, okay? Uh, uh, but but they are not exactly similar because portions have shifted. They have undergone maybe some rotation or translation or something. They have shifted. But if I look at small portions, there is a lot of similarity here between them. Okay. So so let's say that I say that X is really composed of these three types of features. 
okay one is this type of diagonal line one is this type of diagonal line and the third is this cross okay I can take these three features and construct my X out of them okay so let me let me do this these are my three think of them as convolutional filters okay so these are my three filters if I put this one here what would I then I can put this one this one will match here this one will match here and so on okay so so the entire X can be described as these three features at appropriate locations all right so so this is a this becomes a convolutional filter I take this filter and I just put it everywhere so when I put it here what would be the what would be the result 1 times 1 and then that's a 1 and then minus 1 times minus 1 so that's also a 1 and then I keep filling that in fact because the shapes match perfectly I actually get all ones okay and so that average score I can put here at this portion because they match perfectly the average score is 1 okay that's just standard convolution right um, I can do that convolution here and it turns out that for this filter the average score here is only 0.55 because it matches at some locations but not at others okay and then so if I apply this particular convolutional filter all over I'll get some places with very high score where it matches perfectly okay here 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 even a little bit here okay but I'll get some places with very low score where it does not match at all so wherever it so the idea of convolution we have seen this before wherever a convolution filter matches you actually get high score where it doesn't match you don't get high score okay all right so we we denote this like this I have this and I have convolved it with this and you are familiar with this operation now and this is what I get okay all right so then they said okay for this shape maybe I need three filters okay because there are three types of structures in this shape and so this is one of the filters and I'll get these values for that filter this is another one of the filters I'll get these values for that filter and this is another one of those filters I get these values for that filter okay these are three different convolutions that I'm getting so I, I got three convolutional maps these maps are roughly the same size as the original image well a little bit less maybe because this didn't fit at the boundaries and so on but it's kind of roughly the same size as the original image all right okay so so what happens in the convolutional layer really of a convolution I'll, I'll come to how a convolutional network, network learns these filters because the difference between what I'm describing right now is that the filter is provided by me but we'll actually learn this filter but what happens in the convolutional layer of a neural network is that you take the original image I'm talking about the first layer so I say I want to apply three convolutional filters on it and that three might be more okay and so I get three image copies but those contain the convolutional response okay so one image becomes a stack of filtered images as it passes through a convolutional layer okay how big that stack would be how deep that stack would be it depends on how many filters I apply yes so, yeah. no so we haven't really actually that's where the neural network will come in these filters will be learned by back propagation that's the real difference between the previous approach and new approach and previously we tried to engineer features in fact the entire hog strategy we haven't really discussed this but actually it is possible to write it as a sequence of convolutional filters because ultimately what is hog hog is finding gradients so that's convolutional filters and then I have to do histograms so the sum operation can also be done through convolution and so on so I can actually write the entire hog strategy as a set of convolutional filters if I want to but the difference there is I am specifying the convolutional filters in a neural network we will learn the convolutional filters okay and we'll see how we do that okay but this is the architecture of the convolutional layer the convolutional layer is just implementing a set of convolutional filters and I'll show you how that's done in a neural network architecture in just a moment yes yeah are they what
Okay, so that's a question in general. We discussed this question when we talked about convolution first. Is convolution an invertible process or not? Which means once I convolve the image with something, can I, can I deconvolve it back? And the general answer to that is no. Why? Because convolution sums and adds up. I mean, it multiplies, sums, and adds up. Even if I knew the filter, well, if I don't know the filter, it's, it's called blind deconvolution. That's even harder. Okay, but even if I know the filter, the process is not so simple because what has happened is essentially I gave this example before that I, I, I add two numbers and the answer is 60 and I ask you what were the two numbers I added, right? So there are a lot of possible solutions to that. So in general, it's not easy, even though there are techniques, those are called in signal processing deconvolution techniques and deconvolution can be done when there is some assumptions made either about the image content or about the filter. It can't be gen done in general. Yes. But by some convolution filter, and we learn it, so I really don't know what it will come out to be. Okay, but but if, once I specify the filters, you you know how this operation is done. Okay. All right. So so like I said, through this convolution layer you simply apply it's it's no uh, it's nothing new in a sense you know this operation you have actually coded it in your homework right you know this operation how it's done uh, you simply apply a bunch of convolution filters to the input image to get a bunch of outputs okay all right then so that's one type of structure which is used in a convolutional neural network the convolution layer itself okay uh, then you have another type of structure which is very popular it's called the pooling layer okay the pooling layer is that you could usually pick a window size maybe two or three usually it's a very small window and then you slide it over and there is a stride you don't slide it over at every pixel you jump also while sliding it over so maybe if it's two by two and then you have a stride of two which means you are taking non overlapping two by two windows you walk your window across the filtered image and you just take the maximum value and you can retain that. So actually the output layer becomes smaller. If, if you're using a two by two window, the output layer would shrink on both sides by two. So it would become four times smaller because you are taking max of every two values. Okay, let me show you how that happens. So in the pooling layer, you take these. So this is the output. The, the, these, the, 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 the matrix here is the output of one of the convolutional layers. Okay, you you put this two by two block here and you say what's the max value out of this so the max value is one so you put that here okay then you slide it over so i have a stride of two which means i didn't put the window here i skipped one place i put it here and then i ask myself what's the max value here so the max is 0.33 so i say okay that's 0.33 and then this and then i really can't put it here but this is how typically you use sizes so that you don't spill over but that's 0.3 and so I can keep doing that. I had a stride of two so I jumped here. Okay, I can keep doing that. So notice that this is now smaller in size than this. Roughly about half, depends on the, uh, how many windows you were able to fit, but it's roughly about half if I'm using a stride of two. Uh, so this, is, this operation is called max pooling. Okay, in a way it is there to, to say for every local output that I have from the convolution layer, I'll only keep the best one, the most strongest response, and discard the weaker ones. And that goes forward. If I put a max pooling layer, my, my layer size would shrink to about half on, three, on each dimension, so about four times really. Yes. Uh, I just showed you. Oh, you're taking a max, so you took the max, only two values in here, those are 0, so 12. Uh, if, you, if you take a stride of 1, uh, you can choose a stride of 1, but stride of 2 is pretty popular. Okay, because because if I take a stride of one, then there is an overlap between this max and this max. No, 
the, the, you, you'll get more value, so this image will be bigger size. Right? So the size reduction will not happen. Okay, these are, by the way, hyperparameters. You can take their choices. But uh, a pooling layer of 2 by 2 with a stride of 2 is very popular. Okay, so what will happen? I had from the first layer, let's say I had one convolutional layer with three filters. So these, these are the three outputs that I got. I applied max peeling on each one of them. Each one of them become now a smaller size. Okay, so that's another type of layer which is used in a convolutional neural network, this pooling layer. The pooling layer keeps reducing the size of the network. Okay, uh, typically, wh why, why do you do that? You keep reducing the size of the network because typically the input is very large, right? 200 by 200 by 3, so the input is pretty large. And the output you want is a few categories typically. Maybe if it's a face detection problem, you want it's a face or not. So you're going to have two outputs only. Uh, in ImageNet challenge, which has a lot of outputs, well, even then it's about a thousand outputs. A thousand outputs is nothing compared to 200 by 200 by 3, right? So, so ultimately you have to get down to this smaller size. And so you introduce pooling layers in the middle and every time you shrink the size and then you have some more convolutional layers after that. Okay, so what does a pooling layer do? A stack of images remain a stack of images, but it becomes a stack of smaller images. So what was the convolutional layer doing? A single image becomes a stack of images in, in a convolutional layer. In a pooling layer, uh, a stack of images becomes a smaller stack of images. All right. And then you have a third type of layer, which is your nonlinear function. The function of choice these days, uh, it's it's quite popular is these ReLUs, uh, rectified linear units. Uh, we talked about that last time. Uh, as uh, uh, Without this nonlinearity, uh, the neural network is not going to work. In fact, the max operation itself is a nonlinear operation. So that's an introduction of a convolution is a linear operation pr purely. But the max operation itself is a nonlinear operation, uh, if you think about it mathematically. Uh, but we introduced this additional nonlinearity, which is the ReLU. Okay? So, in, in, in ReLU, what we do is, uh, well, ReLU is a pretty simple function. If the, if the value is positive, I will remain it. I, I will just retain that value. If the value is negative, I'll make it zero. That's what the ReLU function says, okay? So I can just slide over and this filtered image will become this image if I apply ReLU to it. All right? Uh, it, it, it's just like taking if if there is any negative, replace it with zero. That's all the real layer does, and that introduces a nonlinearity in your network. All right. So what does a real layer do? A stack of images remains a stack of images of the same size, but it has no negative values. All the negative values are fixed to zero. Okay. These are the three dominant types of layers which are used in a neural network, okay? So in a convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural network is really just a stack of these layers. So for example, I have this input image. This is one convolutional network. It has a convolution layer of certain number of filters. And then it has a ReLU layer and then it has a pooling layer and that's your output, let's say, okay? So I can just stack them together in a combination. In fact, this is how I describe a network. If, if I wanted to describe LXNet to you, the network that he, they used in the large scale image recognition challenge, I will just describe to you, okay, because it's a CNN, it's a standard CNN, I will just describe to you, okay, in the beginning they had this many convolutional layers, and then they had a ReLU, and then they had this, ma this many convolution, and then they had a ReLU, and then they did a pooling, and then they had a convolutional layer of this many filters, and then a ReLU, and then they did a pooling, and that was their output. Okay, there's one other type of layer which is actually used a lot and that's called an FC layer, a fully connected layer. An FC layer is actually, there is nothing new to it. The standard, neural, the standard vanilla neural network that we were talking about yesterday is actually an FC layer. Uh, every layer is an FC layer. Th those are fully connected layers, okay? So, so an FC layer means you take your whatever image you have and let's say you make it into a vector and then you just connect that entire vector to a node. Typically, FC layers in CNNs are used towards the end. 
okay so so i'll have all these connected to an x and all these connected to this o node and that will be my output finally okay so this is an fc layer everything i have at the input i uh, the network that i showed you before i was left with these four numbers from each filter okay and then i just connected all those four times three twelve to these two nodes so this type of layer is called an fc layer all right yes yeah how do you come up with architectures people have built experience on it yes that's true that's true okay so different papers that come out these days have different architectures and they kind of justify and people have built some insights into what happens if i reduce too fast the size of my network what happens if i reduce and then increase again uh, they have come up with some insights into that but largely it's ki some kind of like black magic that you do no no different types of structures have different advantages as we'll see uh, but this is not fully understood there isn't there isn't like a nice mathematics to this that okay given this problem this is the architecture you would use and why is that because actually that higher dimensional space in which i have to do decision boundaries is not very well understood right that is the space of the weight vectors because the weights are the unknowns here so that's a very high dimensional space because there are millions of weights in the neural network so it's not very well understood what order of nonlinearities exist in that space with respect to my classification Uh, no, so there is like a loose reason, and I, actually there are other options than max pooling. But the the the, the kind of loose reason I, reasoning is that we are reducing the size of the network and keeping only the strongest inputs, the ones which are generating the strong strongest activations, because the hope is that those strongest activations are coming from the strongest filter responses for that category, right? So it kind of makes sense. Yes. Why do we apply pooling? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't really think it fundamentally matters. Uh, the the idea is to introduce a non introduce enough nonlinearities in your network so that the decision boundaries can be nonlinear. And the max pooling layer itself is nonlinear, and then the ReLU layer is definitely nonlinear. Okay. They can be applied. In the they could be applied in. Uh, I mean, uh, they can be liberally spread out over the network in in different ways. In this example, uh, what would be the, the number of neurons at the output of the neural network? Uh, uh, two. Because it's a two category problem. So it's a linear machine with two outputs and I'll take the max of those outputs and say that's the decision. So if I had like 10 categories, I'll have 10 outputs here. And if I had like a thousand categories in ImageNet, I'll have a thousand outputs here. So you can actually go and download uh, Google's neural network which is trained on ImageNet. Uh, it's easily available. In fact, uh, we have a tutorial today on MatConfNet, uh, which is a MATLAB library to uh, set up neural net uh, convolutional neural networks. And uh, you can download Google's trained uh, ImageNet uh, network, and that has a thousand outputs. And you give it any image, and it says, well, this looks like a banana. Okay? So, uh, because it will give you a thousand dimensional vector where the banana output would be high if the input image was a banana. So you can actually try it out. It's already been trained. The training took a long time. Uh, there look a lot of machines a long time, but now it's trained. You can run it very quickly. Okay. All right. So uh, so yeah. Let me skip this. Uh, so this is what a fully connected layer is. It's a it's a list of feature values that becomes ultimately becomes a list of words. Okay. And you can also have a stack of fully connected layers if you wanted to. Uh, and each one of them has its own size. Okay. All right, so putting it all together, this is what a CNN might look like. Some conv layer, relu, conv, relu, pooling, 
So that reduces the size and then cons, relu, pulling, that reduces the size more and then an FC, FC and that's the output. Okay? Yes? FC is just a fully connected layer. It's actually like FC is the easiest to explain because that's what we were discussing yesterday. It's just a fully connected neural network. Okay? All, all weights. So, so this is the key thing. Where do all the magic numbers come from? The, what are the features in the convolutional layer, right? Uh, well, the answer to that is back propagation. That's the key thing. I'm not going to specify which filters I want for my problem. I'll set up this structure, a neural network that is actually implementing filters. And I'll just show you in a, in a visualization how that's done, okay? But I'll set up this structure, but I won't specify the weights of the filters. I won't specify the filter values. That was the old approach. People were trying to come up with better and better filters for different problems. I'm not going to do that. Okay. All I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the correct structure and let back propagation learn the filters. So those filters will be the filters that get learned in the convolutional layers. Those filters will be kind of the optimal filters. If my network has converged to a good solution, those will be the optimal filters which can distinguish between my classes. So if I have a class of, let's say, cars versus uh, trees, okay? So maybe I will learn some filter which are kind of round shape filters to kind of fit to the wheels because cars typically have wheels and, and, and trees don't, okay? And trees, maybe I'll learn some filters which match to like branching of, uh, I mean, the, 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 the branches and the leaves and so on. So I so, so I leave all of that. What is a good choice of filters in this in this deep learning approach? I leave all of that to the network to learn. Okay, now uh, let, uh, so there are a bunch of hyperparameters here. Well, what is the architecture to begin with? I don't quite know how many layers of each type in what order convolution. What's the number of fi filters should I use and what's the size of each filter? Uh, pooling, what's the window size, what should be the stride, fully connected, how many neurons should I have in the fully connected layer. Uh, all of this is kind of uh, not known. You have to, these are hyperparameters that you might have to optimize over. Or you just take your guess and try it or or you just, the, 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 the standard approach is that you just try a lot of those and do training on each one of them and then see which one works better for you, which kind of architecture works better for you. And that's very, very computational expensive approach to take. Okay. All right. So let me do a little bit more detail look at CNNs. Then uh, you, you kind of understand now what's CNN. It's not a news channel, right? <laughs> at least you know that much. <laughs> so, um, so I said I'll apply the convolutional filter. Uh, the, the, but but I have to encode the convolutional filter inside the neural network, so, and there is no like sliding going over, right? As as it happens in the convolution, right? So let me show you how how I make a filter. So so I have an eight by eight image, and I have a three by three filter. So that's my filter, and I have a stride of one. Okay, so the output will become because I have to fit three by three windows here. I'll only get six window fittings here fits here. Okay, so the output is going to be six by six. Okay, so this point in the output, uh, what I'm saying is I can have a static structure of the neural network in the sense that it is implementing convolution. Okay, and how will I do that? Uh, so, so I will have these links made to get to this output, right? Agreed? So these are how many links? Nine, because I have a three by three filter, so I have nine links here that are coming to this output. Okay, and then I have nine other links that are coming to this output, right? And I have nine other links that are coming to this output and nine other ones which are here and nine other ones which are here and nine other ones which are here. In my neural network, they're all going to be there. But understand that that's a lot less than the FC layer would have. Okay, because how many did I, how many links did I do this in one row right now? Well, that's nine times six. But if I were to connect a structure which is three by eight, fully to six neurons, that would be a lot more. Okay, I'll, I'll do that calculation in just a moment. Yes? No, no, I didn't. I said stride one. 
So I've just taken a choice here. In convolution, you typically don't use a stride. You use stride one, and but in max pooling, you do a larger stride. You do stride two. Okay, but even in convolution, you can do stride if you wanted to reduce. Every architecture will learn differently. Yeah, so I can't really make that statement. Okay. Uh, but I'm, I'm telling you first the typical way to do this and then people have lots of variations here okay all right so I'll go to the next row so there's gonna be all these weights each one of them is a 3 by 3 block coming to a pixel okay and then I go to the next row they're gonna be these and next row they're gonna be these and next row they're gonna be these and next row they're gonna be these this took me about like one whole night to make this animation <laughs> so you better look at it carefully right <laughs> it's like one full night of my life that I spent in trying to create this <laughs> okay all right okay so so what I can do is I can put all of them together that will be the structure that I will encode there's no sliding going over but this implements a convolution Okay, except that I have a restriction here. Uh, we use both types of strategies in CNN, but the strategy of choice is uh, we call this parameter sharing, which means that these are the total number of links, but each one of them, each one of those three by three groups ultimately will have the same set of weights. It's not that I, because it's like one filter, so it's not that I'll choose a different weights for this, these nine and different weights for these nine and different weights for these nine. So I'm not learning that many weights. In fact, in this structure, well, one thing, there are a lot less links than they are supposed to be possible. Uh, I mean, there, there were supposed to be in, in an FC layer. Okay. Uh, but secondly, the, the number of weights are actually very less because I'm, I'm, I'm doing parameter sharing. I'm, I'm saying it's not that the filter will also change as I'm sliding over. There's no sliding over going on, but the, just the convolution analogy uh, the filter should not change as you slide over so the weights remain the same so I'm actually learning just nine weights for this whole structure and that's where the problem becomes tractable okay you understand that yes well you have to code that right of course <laughs> now now these days you don't have the first guy who did this he had to code it of course, I mean, it's codable. I mean, there's nothing problematic with it. But nowadays, you have a bunch of libraries available and they already have this option built into them. So you just specify the parameters of the network and they set up the network for you. One of the libraries, we are going to have a tutorial today on matcon.net, but other famous ones are TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, I mean, lots of them. Every, every big organization has their own favorite library that they are trying to push on the board. Okay. All right, so, so, so this is really what a convolution layer looks like, okay? What is the total number of connections here? Can someone count? Total number of links that I've, I actually drew them, right? So I, I will not do the counting, <laughs> there are a lot. But they're still much less than FC layer. Yes, how many? Huh? Six into nine? 36 into nine. 36 into nine, yeah, that's correct. So it's six by six by one, that's how many outputs you have. And each one of them has three by three by one. I say by one because ultimately you don't apply one filter. You might have a lot of filters. So that's why I explicitly wrote one there. Okay. But it's really 36 by nine. That's the total number of links there. How, what's the total, what would have been the total number of connections if this was an FC layer? Sixty-four into thirty-six, right? Which is a lot larger number than six into uh, thirty-six into nine. Okay, and in fact, this advantage that I have between the FC layer and the fully connected layer, even though there is a lot of advantage that you see here, but but it's actually less pronounced because this example is very small. As you go to larger and larger, larger image sizes, this this advantage will be extreme between how many links you have in an FC layer and how many links you have in a convolutional layer. Right for a 200 by 200 image, this advantage would have been rather extreme, uh, but it's actually quite large here, also even on this very small toy example. Okay, uh, what's the total number of unique parameters? W by that I mean, how many weights do you have to learn? Uh, a little bit more, 10 actually, right? Because you have a you have nine weights that actually multiply, and then one addition term, which is the bias term. So, so there are actually 10, but uh, almost nine, yeah. 
so so that's the that's the real advantage that a cnn gives you it makes this learning problem possible whereas in a in a fully fc fc type of deep network this would not have been possible at all we just counted the order of weights that would have been there in the beginning of the lecture and that's like a crazy crazy number right i mean we are we are talking about in this example i mean the last example that i gave you that was like 10 billion something weights right and here we are talking about nine weights or 10 weights that's that's like phenomenal okay of course this this comes with some restriction the restriction is that you can only learn filters of a small size if if your size is small i mean you can only learn filters of the size that you specified you can't learn something more complicated than that in one layer but it turns out that that's actually good enough uh, from practice we learned that that's actually good enough okay how does the pooling layer work so i'm i'm putting a pooling layer on top of this which is a two by two pooling stride two okay which means that's reduced the six by six to a three by three okay so if so those will be the two by two blocks that i'll have here and then this is how they will be connected these four blue ones will be connected to this blue and then i'll always take just the max of them to put the value here and then these four will be connected to this orange one and so on okay so this is how now so with that understanding this is how you typically describe a convolutional layer okay so i said my image is 32 by 32 by 3 that's for c 10 data set that's what the image size was okay so this is how i show it as a as a picture typically for for describing your architecture this is how you show it you say you have a width and a height of 32 and 32 and you have a depth of 3 okay so that's your input layer which is just the image okay and now you have a filter so i say my filter is uh, 5 by 5 by 3 okay which means that's that's like one convolutional filter uh, why is it by 3 because the original layer was by 3 and i need to kind of use all those images to get to my output okay so my filter is 5 by 5 by 3 and this is a convolutional filter and i will slide it over the image especially computing the dot products okay except that i actually physically don't slide it over i just create the network connections like i showed you to to implement this filter okay i just create the appropriate connections okay uh, uh, the filters always extend to the full depth of the input volume because otherwise you are just not using all the all the input data okay so that's why this three and this three always match okay and then uh, when the filter is at one location you actually get one number as a result of taking the dot product of 5 by 5 by 3 is equal to so it's a 75 dimensional dot product plus bias and that's just a linear equation right so w so this is similar to what we were talking about when we were saying linear classifiers so, yes, can the pooling be oriented? no 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 i'm just describing the convolution so, uh, the answer would be one layer the the input is has depth three the filter has depth three but the answer would be one layer because the filter has been applied and so the convolutional result at each location is a scalar right so it's just the dot product of all those even in depth it's just taking the dot product of all those Right? It's not like three separate filters which will give you three outputs. It's one filter. Okay? Uh, so what you do is, you, of course, you slide it all over. And in this case, because, because my filter is, uh, 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 is 5 by 5, right? So, and I don't want it to spill over. So two, uh, there is a reduction in size of 2 from that size and 2 from this side. Right, because the half window is two. Uh, the variable a lot of you were using in your coding. I mean, there's a the filter is going from think about it minus two to plus two. That's why it's five size. Okay, so therefore I'll get a twenty-eight by twenty-eight by one sized output when I apply this filter. 
Agreed? Everyone is clear with that? These numbers are actually important. It's not that, oh yeah, I'll figure those out. Why? Because when you are coding, you are specifying these numbers to the network. And so you need to count these numbers in your head exactly. Otherwise your code might get bugs and so on. Because, because you actually don't go and, uh, and, and code the convolutional structure or so on because that's, that's inside the library in itself. All you do is you specify, I need a layer of this size. And then you calculate what would be the output of that. And so the next layer should be exactly of this size to match that output size and so on. Yes. Sir, since we will be pulling for the maximum value in the activation map, hmm. um, is it also possible that uh, we pad the image with zeros such that when it goes, I mean, our filter can uh, slide through the old image with, without spilling over? Padding can be done. Uh, in fact, padding is an option in most libraries. I'm uh, Here, I did not do any padding. But yes, you can do padding if you want to. Okay. All right. So, yes. Why did the word? Because it's convolution. Conv because the convolution is happening over RGB values also. The filter is three dimensional. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's it's filtered out. But it, I mean, you don't call it grayscale because because grayscale is used for pictures. This is not a this is not an image anymore. It's an output of a filter. It's like edge detection, for example. Okay, is that clear or not? Yeah. Okay, so now what you could do is you don't have to do just one filter. You can do two filters if you want to. So you'll get two layers of 28 by 28 by 1. Or you could do like six filters. Okay. So you get, you can get six different activation maps, six different outputs of those filters, 28 by 28 by 6. Okay. Think of it as this is like a new image now that has passed through one layer. I applied six convolutional filters on it and I got this at the next layer. What's the advantage of taking multiple filters? Uh, multiple filters increase your capacity. You can measure multiple things about your image. Typically, you would not want just have one edge detection filter only. Then that means from now on in the network, you can only use edges and nothing else. Maybe there was something else interesting in the image. Right. Okay. So the convent, comnet is just a sequence of convolution layers and, and other types of layers, relus and so on. Okay. So, so this is how I might write a con that I say I have 32 by 32 by 3 input and then the next layer I'll just specify is 28 by 28 by 6. That means I'm using 6 filters of 5 by 5 by 3. Well, 5 by 5 I have to specify but 3 is specified because the input was 3. Okay. And, and typically after a convolution you do a relu because well, that stems from our understanding of neural networks that after you do this thought product, you use the activation function. Okay. And so then I say, okay, what's the next layer? I'll say, now I will use another 10, 5 by 5 by 6 filters. Now this has to be 6, right? Because there were 6 here. The depth was 6 here. Okay. So I'll use another 10, 5 by 5 by 6 filters. So what will happen is that each one of those filters will give me one layer. Since they are 5 by 5, I'll get another reduction of 2 and 2 here because I'm not using any padding. So this is now 24 by 24 by 10 because there were 10 filters applied. Okay, so that's how you keep building your sequence. Yes. Uh, yes, you could think of it like that. These are, these are linear filters. So you could think of it as perceptrons. So how many filters did you use in that layer yes that's that's a good way to look at it yeah all right so here's here's like a visualization of uh the this is by jan Likun, who is uh, actually let me say a little bit about history there also so it's not that cnns were invented in 2012. uh hinton's paper was not the cnn first cnn paper in fact the first cnn paper was 
not even in 2002 10 years before that it was it was close to in 1998 right so it was like 14 years before that by Jan Lincoln this guy who's the head of Facebook AI Facebook research now and in fact even that 1998 paper had precursors in in papers written 10 years earlier than that okay so so CNNs are nothing new they just became popular now and in fact these researchers who wrote these papers like 14 15 years ago or 20 years ago were a bit upset when everybody got so excited about CNNs because they were saying we have been telling you <laughs> for so long <laughs> that they work very well and you don't believe us <laughs> right um, uh, but but of course now each uh, Hinton is at Google Research and uh, Jan Liken is at uh, is the head of uh, Facebook Research. Uh, so all of them are like big name celebrities now. But for a lot of time, nobody was listening to them too much. People were just people were just using SVNs. When I was doing my PhD at these times, I mean these CNNs existed, but I didn't even know about them. I mean, anytime we have a machine learning problem, we just use the standard SVN library to solve it. Okay, so but this is a slide from Jan Likan. It's a, uh, it's actually a very instructive slide because uh, here what he's showing you is for some learning problem, for some classification problem, what he's showing you is the features which are learned at the first layer. He made a visualization of those filters. Okay, and you and you see that these filters look actually very similar to like first order filters, like edge filters that we were using to find edges or so on. Okay, for example, this will match to edges which are going in this direction and this will match to edges which are going in this direction. And this is just like a circular filter is trying to look for like maybe maybe a match to a circular structure. Okay, so these are very simple primitive filters which are learned in the first layer. But then what is happening in the next layer or, or some layers after that is that for those layers the input is no longer the original image. The input is these filters, right? Because these layers cascade. So what these layers will learn are combinations of these layers. They are actually convolutions applied to these layer. Okay, so you start to get more interesting structures, more complicated edges, some curves, a circular structure here and so on. You start to get some very interesting structures. Okay, and then if you go further along on the, on the network, well actually what that is using, learning is linear combinations of these things. So those are even more complicated structures. Now you start to see structures that are seen in cars, like maybe half of a rim here, and uh, these wheels, these structures will match well to wheels, and maybe this will be like a window-like structure, and that's like some sort of grid or honeycomb and so on. Okay, so your features start to, uh, in the first layer, you are doing linear combinations of image values. In the next layer, you are doing linear combinations of those features. In the next layer, you are doing linear combinations of those features, and so on. All right. Um, so let me let me skip this maybe. Okay, here here he has shown uh, for an image, he has shown what happens through the network. So there is a conv layer, relu, conv layer, relu, uh, then a pool layer. Then con, vrilu, con, vrilu, pool, and then con, vrilu, con, vrilu, another pool. Okay, and ultimately, then there are five outputs, and the truck car output for this image is much higher than the other outputs. Okay, and these are visualizations of all the filters, outputs of the filters that you get for this image, and then after you do relu, all the negative values are dropped, and then these are the filter outputs, and then the negative values are dropped, and so on. All right. Um, I want to uh, because we have only one more lecture left. I, I'm 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 going to do a slightly longer thing today. So um, so let me talk uh, in detail about dimensions because that's actually very critical. Okay. Uh, here we said we have a 32 by 32 by 3 image and a 5 by 5 by 3 filter. So I'm going to get a 28 by 28 by 1. Let's kind of like generalize that. So what what happens in spatial dimensions? If I have a 7 by 7 grid and I have a 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 filter, okay, it's going to move to all these values, okay. So because it it got only five spaces to 
go so i get a 5 by 5 in output okay so if i if i'm doing a stride 2 with this 3 by 3 filter well the last one so stride true will give me a 3 by 3 output okay if i do a stride 3 well that will not even fit properly okay there will be some sort of spillover that i'll have to deal with okay so so typically you use sizes so that your strides are such that you fit okay typically you do that okay so in general the output size is n where n is your dimension of the image n minus f because because that's how many will fit uh, n minus f divided by stride that's how many will fit plus one okay so if stride was one you get five seven minus three four divided by one four plus one five if if n was uh, if if stride was two seven minus three four divided by two that's a two plus one three which we saw okay and then seven minus three three divided uh, divided by seven minus four uh, seven minus three four divided by three so that's one point three three plus one to two point three three and that tells you that it's not gonna fit okay so that's in general how many fits you will get okay uh, it's a common practice to use zero padding also okay so I can apply a three by three filter with stride one and pad one border pixel and then I can calculate how many uh, if I pad one border pixel I can fit all seven of them okay so in general you can you you can make this into a general formula if you it's given here right filters of size f by f with zero padding with f minus one by two will preserves the size spatially so f minus one by two because on a five by five filter there is going to be maximum two overlap so if you put a two zero padding on all sides then the image size is going to be exactly the same as the original one you, you will not reduce by two okay so uh, so in general what happens is because because every filter shrinks the volume spatially remember what's going on here if i don't use zero padding 32 28 24 now shrinking too fast in a cnn does not work very well so what you do is you shrink slowly uh, you, you if you shrink too fast you reduce your capacity of the network too quickly before you have learned some concepts okay so these are like general rules of thumbs there's no exact science to this but generally you try to shrink slowly you don't you don't do a very fast reduction in the beginning and then make a very long network after that typically okay example uh, i have uh, input volume of 32 by 32 by 3 and 10 5 by 5 filters with stride 1 pad 2 what will be the output volume size Okay, first thing easy. What's the output size depth? <coughs> ten because I've I'm applying ten filters. And what's the spatial dimension of the output? Six by six. Why? Using that form. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so it's actually going to be 32 by 32 by 10, right? Why? Because I did a padding of one here and one here. I did a padding of two. So the 3 by 3 filter actually fits exactly 32 times in the middle because I did a padding on both sides. Okay. Um, so so these are the type of calculations that are going on in your mind when you're actually coding the network. You, 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 have, to, you have to understand these calculations, yeah. No, it's just an option. If I take learning better. It's just an option that you have available so that you are not shrinking the size too too quickly. Okay. How many number of parameters in this layer? Where did 28 come from? Okay, is that correct? Ten into five into five. 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 
10 into 5 into 5 into 3 plus 1. Right? So each filter has 5 by 5 by 3 uh, taps in it. Each filter has 5 by 5 by 3 links in it plus 1. So that's 76 and then I have 10 of those. Agreed? All right, here's some summary here. I mean, all the formulas. I mean, these are obvious formulas, not, not very difficult, but uh, I'll, I'll just skip those, yeah. Um, you can even have one by one convolution filters if you want to. And I have a lot of those. That's not a problem. So, so if we applied a one by one convolutional filter, uh, we get 56 by 56 output here, and I applied 32 of those, so I have 32 depths now. Okay. Uh, so these are the each filter will be one by one by 64 because the depth here is 64 so one by one by 64 applied here and then I applied 32 of those so I get 56 by 56 by 32 okay um, pooling layer you can do similar calculations this is what the pooling layer does the pooling layer will not change depth so if there is a depth of 64 here it will remain a depth of 64 it's just reducing the size and it's making it half Okay, uh, this is what max pooling does. And there are some bunch of formulas here. Let me skip those. Uh, and then FC layer, FC layer, you just connect the whole thing. Okay, uh, okay. So I land here on this slide. So this is uh, Jan Lincoln's paper in 1998, which used a convolution layer in network for. Um, uh, he was working on a problem where he wanted handwritten digit recognition because it was for the postal service. Uh, you have a postcode printed, uh, I mean written by hand on, on, on letters and the post office wanted to um, sort those letters automatically. Okay, so the letters are coming on the conveyor belt, there's a camera, the camera will read the address and and they will just sort by they, they want to read the postcode so they say whether it goes on this uh, bus or this bus right or, or on this plane or this plane so they want to sort them countrywide in, in a sorting center uh, now the problem is people write handwritten digits in uh, all sorts of ways and uh, some people have very poor handwriting <laughs> so uh, so uh, so so that's why it's not an easy problem Right? You, and you need high accuracy because otherwise you'll have uh, a letter ending up in the wrong uh, country and so on. Uh, so, so he had this uh, data set where they have 32 by 32 images. It's actually a very now used data set in machine learning. It's called MNIST digits data set. Uh, it has 10 characters, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and lots of writing samples. And these are binary images uh, cropped up, but they are handwritten uh, samples. And so this is his description. The input is 32 by 32 by 1 because these are grayscale images. In fact, they're actually binary images, I think. Okay. And then uh, he applied, uh, so each of the con filters were 5 by 5 applied at stride 1. Okay. Uh, there was a subsampling pooling layer of 2 by 2 applied at stride 2. And the architecture is conf pool, conf pool, conf FC. Okay. So that's the architecture he used. So there are uh, there were six filters applied at this layer so because it's five by five and he was not using any zero padding so the size became 28 by 28 by six okay and then after that he did subsampling so the 28 by 28 I mean a pooling layer so the 28 by 28 became 14 by 14 so he has now 14 by 14 by six here then he applied 10 more filters okay uh, sorry then he applied 16 more filters on this so he got Again, they are 5 by 5, so they are going to reduce the size by 4. So you got 10 by 10 by 16 because he's applying 16 more filters. Okay. And then he did a reduction, so you get 5 by 5 by 16 after max pooling. Okay. Uh, there, it's assumed that there is a nonlinear layer in the middle, like a, I don't know if he was using tan hyperbolic. I don't think at that time they were using relus. Uh, but, but the conv layer means that after conv, there is a nonlinear layer there. Okay, so 5 by 5 by 16, and then he has, uh, 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 then he has a fully connected layer to reduce it into a 120 dimensional vector, and then another fully connected layer to reduce to an 84 dimensional vector, and then finally to a 10 dimensional vector. So he has like three FC layers uh, in the end. 
and uh, that 10 dimensional vector is is where he gives the ground truth to compare against the error function and then the back propagation happens okay so that's where we'll stop i've shown you an architecture and we have done we have covered how this architecture is described okay now i can actually just go and describe to you the alexnet paper which was the 2012 paper or, or subsequent improvements of that in just a single slide because all i'll do is well this is the architecture they used i'll just describe the structure there yes how do we go from that well 16 by 5 by 5 is just a vector which is 160 dimensional and I made another vector which is another set of nodes which is 120 dimensional and I just connected all of them so that's an FC layer and 120 is the dimension of the FC layer so I decided yeah so I so he decided that I'm going to have an FC layer of 120 and then another of 84 and then another of 10 rather than just having one FC layer which will reduce from 160 down to 10 he, he did it in three FC layers so he's introducing more more weights there yes yes uh, uh, you know how to do that now right given last lecture we spent a lot of time on that okay all right so uh, I have uh, uh, a few announcements I'll stop here uh, we'll continue from there so tomorrow there is a class I already made that announcement the classes that will begin at 10 o'clock inshallah and it will be a slightly longer class because we'll, we'll everything else which I wanted to cover we'll just cover and so we'll keep continuing till till we are done okay so <laughs> so that will be a that will begin at 10 a.m and then you'll have a quiz after that uh, so uh, so that's yeah okay all right and uh, what else there's a tutorial today so what will we do in the tutorial we'll we'll uh, so i've extended the deadline of the previous homework uh, that's still tomorrow and we will do a tutorial today uh, which is uh, uh, on matconf.net. Matconf.net is one of the libraries because we are using MATLAB. It's like an easy library to use in MATLAB. So uh, the tutorial will begin at two o'clock, and uh, Khurram, uh, I mean, uh, one of the former students here at Lums, he'll come and give the tutorial because I have to go somewhere else. He will uh, describe to you how to set up a network like this. For example, exactly this Linet. Linet is a very a famous network and you can set it up and train easily on even a small machine like uh, like this one uh, you don't need like a very big gpu to be able to do this training because lnet itself is small and the image size is small and so the training happens okay so he'll describe to you how to set up maybe lnet in matconf.net uh, and then the homework that you have is on cfar10 data set uh, which is uh, i described that data set to you uh, on, uh, on on that data set you have to set up a network and and train it and I've described the architecture of a network so uh, so that's the next homework all right uh, any other question comment yeah Sir, how long will it to it? Uh, well it will continue till you get it <laughs> maybe maybe one and a half hour two hours okay so it will start at two uh, this tutorial is important because uh, Otherwise, you'll have to figure out the homework yourself. Okay, and the homework is really nothing but setting up a CNN and training it. That's all. Uh, in fact, two different CNNs and training them. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. So now, now if you if you if you submit an assignment to, uh, four by the deadline, the new deadline that I've announced, which is I think tomorrow. Uh, then that wouldn't be counted late. Yeah, and I have allowed three resubmissions. So even if you submitted it and you want to improve it, you can do it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just one second.